Hi, good afternoon everybody, good morning if you're calling in from uh, the US. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm uh, Colin Nelson, Director of Strategic Consulting at Hype. Um, and my role at Hype is to focus on the people and process considerations associated with enterprise collaborative innovation. Um, so I focus on how do we ensure that people come and engage and how do we ensure that when they do engage, they do so at a good level of, of business value. Uh, for as many of you will know, my day job consists of really working closely with our, with our clients, things like looking at the change management considerations associated with programs, process training, um, awareness raising of, uh, of this kind of technique, as well as doing coaching for uh, innovation management professionals to help them steer through the, uh, their own path towards um, effective enterprise programs. Today I'm going to be talking about sustainable programs. Um, how do we ensure that over time we have a program that delivers effective value to the company year after year, that has growing levels of participation and is everything that we, we hope and dream it's going to be. I'll step back and have a look at some of the foundations for a sustainable program and refer back to some of the cultural considerations that you may have seen before in previous webinars. And also look at some very practical steps associated with each of the key foundations uh, that we discuss. We'll have a Q&A session at the end of this, so feel free to submit your questions as we go. And at the end, I'll uh, do my best to answer that any that have come up on the, throughout, the, uh, throughout the hour. So let's start off with um, what sustainable enterprise innovation actually looks like. Um, most com individuals that come to me and say we're looking for a sustainable program, what they mean in practice is that over time, engagement is going up. So it's no longer just a departmental or a countrywide or a project-wide program with people sharing ideas, collaborating, and taking innovations through to implementation. It's actually something that builds and builds and builds year after year. And of course, the anticipation is, is the more participation we actually drive, the greater levels of innovation that we begin to see as we find more diverse opinions from different corners of the organization having different groups of people working together on a variety of different innovation challenges. And as far as the company is concerned, what they really care about is increasing business value over that period of time. So that we know if we can see engagement increasing, levels of innovation increasing, and business value increasing, we are heading towards a more sustainable path. But it's worth us considering the alternative as well and the main threats to sustainable programs and what perhaps they look like. Some companies struggle and finding that the company actually lacks belief in the program. Others find that it simply takes too long to deliver real valuable results to the company and therefore people disengage. And simply there's a lack of success, there's a lack of feedback. And over time, we find that participation drops, innovation levels drop, and of course, in turn, level of business value drops. And the two most common shapes of that sort of failure look like this. One program, the dark blue line, never really gets off the ground. We struggle to gain any interest in the, the, the concept of online collaborative innovation. The second uh, model, the big peak followed by the big drop-off, um, you may have seen before, uh, particularly in relation to Dropbox type systems, where initially when we allow people to come and collaborate online and share their innovations and uh, share ideas, we get a big peak of participation. And then we find after a certain period of time that drops off quite dramatically to almost nothing. And often that means that we've in in infused people, we've managed to excite them initially but we haven't been able to follow through, so that over time they've lost belief in that program and the excitement's now gone. And to recover from that, of course, is a challenge. If we look at the foundations for a sustainable program, um, they fit into four key categories. These are the most significant aspects which we find mitigate that shape of, of participation drop-off or, or the one where we struggle to get off the ground. The first one, of course, is communications keeping people in the loop, confidence in the process, and aware of what's going on. The second we find is quite crucial is to begin to grow the innovation community, the informal network of professionals that actually contribute in a soft way to the success of the program. We also find a big uh, synergy, amount of synergy between 
organizations that have a relatively broad focus of innovation activities and the level of sustainability and business value that they drive. So those that are very narrow are somewhat riskier. Those that have time and energy on a whole range of different innovation activities seem to have a greater chance of long-term success. And finally, what we also find is by using software to engage people we are now able to look and consider data associated with participation, with funnel shape, with seeing how whether we're, we're increasing the um, amount of value in our uh, portfolio or not. So a huge amount of data becomes available much easier than perhaps in more manual uh, previous days of uh, enterprise innovation. And I'm going to dig into each of those different foundations um, a little bit later. But just to give you a sort of high level introduction, the purpose of communications is really to keep people in the loop to share success stories, making sure that people believe in the approach. Even if they haven't participated previously, it's important they understand that this program is successful so that when they do see a topic that's interesting, that's engaging to them, that's relevant to their day job, they don't hesitate to come and participate. Also, we can advertise for different types of innovation challenges linked quite closely to that broadening of focus I spoke about a moment ago. Growing the innovation community means looking for this informal network. The people that perhaps are not paid innovation professionals, perhaps they have day jobs, but they are people that can help spread the message. One of the things that we find is that peers have much greater influence over each other than top-down formal communications. So having a network of people, all kinds of levels within the company, who are able to talk articulately about the program, share success stories, encourage people to participate, helps virally spread uh, a, a greater level of confidence and belief within the, pro within the company about the program. I mentioned a moment ago that we find there's a huge amount of synergy with those organizations that have a relatively broad portfolio of innovation activities and how sustainable they are. And there's some good reason for that. If, of course, you're looking at both tactical and more strategic and more radical activities at the same time, the tactical activities usually deliver business value much quicker. So we can demonstrate success, we can shout about it, creates greater belief and confidence in the program as a whole, and then the rest of the, the, rest of the program can benefit from those increased levels of belief and engagement. So increasingly we're seeing companies looking at growth, but also efficiency in parallel with that, using the same collaborative innovation techniques like idea campaigns to help boost the value of both. So we're encouraging a lot of companies now to look at areas beyond the traditional spaces for innovating products and services and see where else we can actually have value for the company. And the final, final foundation is about using the data. Initially, all we have to indicate whether a program is successful is levels of participation and engagement. We can look at audience behaviors by seeing what they're doing and looking at the software. But also we can look at some more metric-driven information, things like portfolio value, whether we're actually driving through uh, and realizing the types of concepts that we're putting through the, um, the, the stage gate later on, which actually consider the shape of our uh, traditional idea funnel over time and whether we're improving it. Of course, data over time is, is, is valuable. Data at any particular point in time is not so telling when it comes to sustainability. And we'll drill into this a little bit more later. Now, before we go any further, I want to consider a prerequisite, and I want to think about enterprise levels of engagement within your program. Now, if you've attended uh, one of my previous webinars on culture, some of this content will be familiar to you. I think it's worth stepping back and looking at it again, just to put the rest of the content we talk about with regard to the foundations in context. I often ask people, what do they consider to be a culture of enterprise innovation? What it actually means to them? And often people sort of look at me blankly, even though this is something they've said that they want, because they're not quite sure how that should manifest itself. So perhaps an, an alternative way of looking at this is, what behaviors do you want to see from people within the company? Do you want them to be sharing ideas, concepts? Do you want them to be carrying out reviews of other people's ideas? Do you want them to be contributing as experts later on down the innovation funnel when they see a, see a chance? And maybe that's a better way to think about this. 
because understanding culture is, is very difficult. Many of you work for large complex organizations and there will be many different cultures within your wider company culture. Maybe the wider company culture doesn't even exist. So trying to improve that culture is, is, is almost a step too far. We need to look at it in much smaller increments. Um, one way to think about behaviors is to think about what we call the secret checklist. This is the little checks that invitees to innovation programs, online innovation programs, will do before they choose whether they participate or not. And these are things that we can actually measure because we can see whether they're actually participating, logging on, and, and participating in a good way. Now, this little checklist is really quite helpful because once we know what those little checks are, we can begin to mitigate them in our communications programs, in the way we focus people's energies, what sort of topics for innovation we pick. It becomes very helpful in actually beginning to create more creeping enthusiasm for the program as a whole. So things like, am I allowed to participate? Is this a good use of my time? Will my middle manager stop me? Will they not be so enthusiastic? You know, will my ideas be treated respectfully? Um, and they're not going to want to wait years to find out what's happened. So if we can consider that, then we can create a counter list to this, beliefs that we wish to instill, and have this run through the root and branch of our enterprise programs. So what we want to do is make it clear to people, if you do this, it's going to help. The company supports you to spend time on this. And we, of course, need to address that middle management layer that may not necessarily uh, care so much about that. We need to make people see, help people see that from the participation of others, that actually contributions are being taken seriously, they are being treated respectfully, and this is a good thing to be part of. And maybe we can use that innovation community to actually help develop some of that. So if we understand what the, the concerns might be and try and mitigate them as far as possible, this will help us give us a, a baseline of behaviors that we can begin to track. Unless we can get people participating, we're, we're going to struggle for any kind of progress. So this has got to be the first step. How do we get the right behaviors going? So um, as many of you will have seen before, we tend to group people in five different categories. These are, these are different types of categories that we can, we can actually track and see and understand, and in some cases actually measure whether they're actually doing the things that we want them to do. If we think about what sort of behaviors we might want to measure, it's very straightforward. We want people to think, you know, I will share my ideas and insights when asked. We want people to help each other, to build on the ideas and concepts of each other, and have that underpinned by perhaps not a behavior, but a confidence, a trust in the organization and their colleagues. And we want to see those behaviors at various different times when perhaps people feel inspired, when they feel they can contribute, when they've got something to test with the rest of the organization. Perhaps when they can see mistakes occurring. Constructive criticism is absolutely fine if it stops us from wasting our time on something that's not going to work. So we know what kind of behaviors we want to see, and now we know when we want them. So let's take a slight sidestep. Maybe ask yourselves, how do your company's employees react when asked to participate in enterprise collaborative innovation projects? You know, there'll be some that cheer enthusiastically. You know, they're, they're delighted to be able to get involved finally. There'll be others that perhaps have a degree of cynicism. They, maybe they've seen uh, these sort of things fail in the past and perhaps are not so sure whether they want to participate. And perhaps there's a level of confusion about what it is you're actually really trying to do. So bearing all of this in mind, where this is led hype to do is to create these five categories for employees that we can begin to track. So we know what behaviors we want to see. We know how they're going to manifest themselves within the software in terms of participation. And now we want to track what happens over time. And the different organizational shapes that we have will indicate how we then plan our programs moving forward. So I want you now to think about your own organizations. And if you have collaborative innovation programs in place, maybe you have an idea of how many people fit in each of these categories in perhaps percentage terms. So how many enthusiasts you have, people that are bought in, they'll participate in every uh, campaign, every activity that occurs, they just love being part of this process. They're not necessarily offering you the highest value content, but they just want to take part. The next category down is those people that are interested, they're bought in, they, they, they get the value of the process, they understand it. 
and they will participate if the campaign is relevant. There's a third category that appears people that are cautious. Perhaps they're aware of the program, but they're unlikely to participate unless they see the benefits and the value of doing so. And of course, there some of those things may take time to generate. So hopefully you're beginning to see the linkage with actually broadening out the focus. There'll be those that are unaware, that marketing messages haven't reached yet. I spoke with a customer the other day who said they were amazed after two years of running these programs, they found that there were still people that deeply claimed to have no knowledge of the corporate enterprise innovation program. And finally, those are the skeptics, the negatives, those people that are perhaps cynical of the process. Perhaps they don't really believe or want to be part of an innovation program. They don't think it's going to succeed. Or maybe they're skeptical of any corporate initiative. If they've seen those sorts of things fail in the past, they're going to be much harder to convince. Now, I'm not going to spend too much time on how we actually move people up this tree in this particular uh, webinar. But what I'm going to do is use this as a baseline to think about how we can actually look at those foundations and which groups we're going to address with which foundation. So these this this numbers can actually translate into a stack. So if you're doing those calculations in your in your head, perhaps if you're a new organization to this, you may come up with a shape like this. There'll be obviously those that are sort of skeptical and not want to get involved straight away. There'll be a big group that are unaware if you're just on, on day one. Perhaps there are not so many yet aware of the program that are that are, that are skeptical, uh, that, are, that are waiting to see value. And there may be a small group of people that are sort of, yeah, that they're your close units, close network people that are already enthusiastic and perhaps those that will participate from time to time. It's an example shape. Every company is going to be unique. And so normally for most organizations early on they look something like this. Most people are unaware, some cynical, but the big challenge here is going to be marketing, bringing people, raising the awareness and pushing them into those green categories. Then you may see a shape like this where perhaps there's been a history of corporate innovation failure. Perhaps in these, these organizations, something has gone wrong in the past and lots of people are very cynical. And so that's going to be more difficult to actually get real value out of that program. That's not to say it can't be done, but it needs to be a different shape. And perhaps there are those that may have a history of successful enterprise innovation. Perhaps they have previously got people involved in innovation in manual ways, through brainstorming sessions, through creativity training. But there's some kind of latent enthusiasm for being part of the process. As I said, every organization has their own shape, and that shape will change over time. Your day one may look different to the next organization's day one. But recognizing which the dominant categories of behavior help us then focus what we need to do according to those foundations in order to build a sustainable program. And there's just some examples. Um, Swisslog had a, a shape very similar to that. Um, we worked with a big power company that had a shape that's uh, quite cynical and quite negative. And if you uh, speak to Peugeot at our uh, forum coming up, you'll find they had a pretty latent, enthusiastic group, people that were quite keen to participate on, on day one once they started. Um, now, of course, uh, likely track, what we would like to see is something like this, where we find that people are moving from the unaware, more cynical groups into the green categories, and that gives us you know, confidence that, of course, this program is sustainable. So if we're measuring that transition over time, how many people sit in each category, then we know that we're moving into the right direction. Now, not all these measured numbers can be measured completely um, uh, perfectly, but some judgment needs to be made, but some of them certainly can be made. Of course, as we move to that direction, we know we've, we feel confident we're making good progress, but there is a risk here as well. Things don't always go to plan, and so we find that sometimes this sort of path happens, where initially we start seem to be moving in the right direction, but then enthusiasm, belief drops off, and perhaps people end up as cynics, whereas previously they were just unaware. So if you remember that curve where it had a big uh, step up in participation early on and then dropped off dramatically, that would perhaps relate to something like this. But of course now, if we're on the far right-hand side of this, this model, we're in a worse position than we were when we started. So we need to think about how we're going to address that. But of course being aware of the warning signs is helpful in making sure that we don't head down that path. And there's sort of things that cause this um, failure, program failure, are things like lack of communications, lack of feedback, um, topics that are no longer so interesting or engaging to the audience. Um, essentially, these are the things that we are addressing with the foundations, those four that we mentioned earlier, and I'll dig into in more detail in a moment. 
So let's look at some practical steps and let's look first at communications. Essentially there are three main basic purposes of, uh, of the communications program, which is four main, main, main cornerstones. The first one is to market the program, essentially addressing those people that were in that dark blue block, the people that are unaware of the purpose and the nature of the program. What is it you need to do in order to get involved? Why should you get involved? And this is how. The second key purpose towards the communications program is to give feedback to the people that choose to participate. Now this is one of the easiest things to forget because actually you're quite busy. Once you run a campaign or you've generated a lot of content, you're now working on that content. And going back to give feedback to those people that chose to participate is actually a time-consuming task. One of the key reasons that we encourage companies to do this though is that you're not actually pitching for them anymore, but you're ensuring that they're coming back next time. Giving feedback offers you no value to the campaign or the activity that you've just run, but will certainly stop people from participating the next time you ask if you haven't given them feedback. Now, all invitees, including those that choose not to participate or are too busy, should still receive some kind of high-level information about what happened in the program that's just been run. Remember, we're pitching for them next time, so they need to be aware that this is a process that has value, that has generated some interesting results, and to share with them some next steps, so that the next time they're invited, they feel more confident to participate. Of course, there needs to be some program level feedback, corporately, around the different types of innovation activities you're doing, what kind of value you're seeing out of that and what the next steps are going to be. Again, this is keeping people in the loop, sharing successes where, they're, where appropriate, going back to activities that maybe you ran a year or two years before and looking at progress and then sharing that progress with people that perhaps participated that, in that time window previously. Again, showing people that this program is working well and we're taking good actions. Now, of course, you are going to need to vary your tactics depending on your shape. So, if you have um, a fairly large blue block of people that are unaware, your bigger tasks are going to be marketing initially. Um, if you have a group of cynics, then eventually you're going to be looking for very small successes and communicating those small, modest successes to those cynics to try and chip away that group and try and move them into at least the yellow and lighter green categories. And of course, if you have a relatively enthusiastic group, then really your job is going to be keeping them enthusiastic and building even more enthusiasm and confidence to the process. So the type of communications you do will, is affected by the type of shape that you have. So even if you don't have a perfect type of idea of exactly how your organization looks, just having a judgment on what the biggest challenges are will help focus those communication needs. And of course, that will change over time. So as your culture changes, the tasks will change. So making that first step from a, a group that's completely unaware to a, a, a group that are you know, partially enthusiastic but mainly just watching is really about awareness, finding some wins, to show some success. Then we're going to need to demonstrate some real value, keep people aware of the program. And eventually we're going to be about leveraging that community, making sure that we are very rigorous with the process of sharing success stories and giving feedback so we keep people in those top green categories. Remember, if we don't maintain momentum, they can drop out of it. And that's when sustainability becomes more of a challenge. So let's look at innovation, your innovation community as another cornerstone of this. Um, if you think about the people right at the top of that shape, the people in the dark green. These are the key enthusiasts, the people that are most enthusiastic about your program. The sort of things that they will do is to participate on all kinds of campaigns, and all kinds of topics, irrespective of the level of, level of knowledge they have about that process. They're highly engaged. They're often good networkers. They're often highly connected across different, different people, different communities. And you can spot them because they will always come up at the top of the statistics with regard to participation when you do your, uh, your analysis. Um, the great thing is they want to help. And we find that if you actually make a direct approach to them and explain to them what you're trying to achieve, they're often very helpful in offering you more information about what's happening within their local community, their local office, and with regards to innovation. They're also usually happy to try and cheerlead for this process as well, to share your success stories, pass them on, to actually encourage people to participate. And what we try to encourage is to bring those people into the fold more formally. So although they still have day jobs, 
we really want them to help advertise and help share success of our programs because they're your eyes and your ears on the ground. This is too big a challenge for a single lone wolf to really drive it through across the entire enterprise. So if you have people that sit in different parts of the organization who can help you make local departmental connections, help understand where the real opportunities are on a local level to innovate are, perhaps they can seed your campaigns as well, providing you with early stage content. And maybe in certain instances actually act as moderators to help drive collaboration between different participants and help boost the quality of ideas. They're a fantastic resource if we can call upon them. And what we would hope for is to have a network of these community volunteers, these advocates that sit in all kinds of different areas of our, of our company. Because of course they have influence across their own regions. And this will help drill into those divisions, those areas which have always been traditionally tough to penetrate. So when you look at your statistics and you find that four out of your five divisions are participating at a good level, but the fifth just simply aren't seeming to, to, to play ball and just aren't engaging, then we can go to our local community volunteer and say, hmm, you know, this is interesting, what, what's, what's going on? Why do you think people aren't participating? Maybe you find there's a local middle manager that's got people off on another project that's very urgent. Maybe you find that the topic that you've asked actually doesn't mean anything in the context of that division. And so the, the nature of the question you've asked actually hasn't engaged that group of people. All of that information is really helpful. And of course, they will help make this program stickier and help your eyes and the ears on the ground. So the third key foundation is to broaden the focus. And this really comes down to how we define innovation. Uh, now I know some of you will focus quite clearly on products and service innovation. Others perhaps have a, a broader view. Perhaps you're thinking about business model innovation, process innovation. If we actually break down what we do, particularly at the front end of our process of capturing content from diverse groups of people, actually taking that content through some rigorous decision making and then turning it into actual actions and activities, moving towards more of the back end, we find that actually those same steps are applicable for a whole range of different topics, not just what we may consider to be traditional innovation space. So often our company's definition or your definition of it paints you into a corner. And so it's maybe helpful to think about are there other areas of the company where we can actually add our skills and our techniques and the concepts that we, we use, which actually could help drive some business value as well. And you know, the way I to think about this is that most executives and shareholders care about two things about all, all, all others, revenue and profit. Now notice innovation isn't listed. It's listed in many company annual reports. But the two things that we're really measured on is revenue and profit. And the innovation is a technique to try and get to those things, of course. So as innovation professionals, we can think about are there other ways of using our skills and our tools and our processes that will actually help deliver revenue and profit to the business? And of course, in our experience, we're seeing a huge amount of change in this space. Whereas people previously would do purely new product innovation, perhaps, now they're thinking about, can we apply these same techniques to things like cost savings? Can we engage the different corners of our organization to make us more, more efficient? You know, we may consider that most of our time needs to be spent on these traditional areas of perhaps incremental or, or tactical innovation, maybe in some instances radical or disruptive things, but there's a whole range of different areas that we can also address using these same principles. So what else can we do to help the company? How can we keep people engaged? If you go to um, uh, people on the shop floor, what you find is that most people don't consider themselves to be core creatives. They don't consider themselves to be natural innovators. Their skill sets perhaps are more with regard to helping people. Maybe they are more comfortable um, offering a critical eye on something that's there already. Or maybe they're people who are more comfortable when it comes to the implementation path. Now all of these things are crucial, but if we make innovation the job of only the creatives, we're only going to engage a certain subset of our company. Now the great thing about broadening the focus out is that we can engage different areas of the company, different people in the process. So perhaps you're struggling to get finance engaged. Perhaps finance don't even consider themselves to be innovation professionals, but they do care about business efficiency. So if we run campaigns on things like cost savings or cash flow improvements, we should find that they'll come and engage. These are things that they care about. Now once they're there, once they're participating, maybe they'll see that they can contribute 
to this innovation process in a different way. So actually having a broad, broader focus helps actually benefit a whole range of different areas. And here's just a quick list that I came up with of things that I feel and have seen um, deliver business value using these same collaborative innovation techniques. So looking for how we can reduce risk in the business. How can we share knowledge or expertise? Other areas where we can share best practices, reduce environmental impact perhaps. If your company is a sort of organization that has to write responses to bids and proposals, how do we ensure that we have the right knowledge and expertise from the company to contribute to that? Could we run campaigns perhaps short in nature to get the best insights, the best knowledge to help write better winning proposals? Of course, uh, many organizations are looking to expand their continuous improvement programs as well, more process-based uh, innovation perhaps. Obviously saving money and solving problems are kind of obvious, obvious steps on the path as well. The point here is that this doesn't need to be the dominating factor for your innovation programs, but having some of these elements as part of it helps make everything else better. It drags more people into the process, helps increasing that network of, of, of people that we can call upon. It helps deliver business value often quicker than many of the innovation activities that we do because most of these things will be relatively transactional. They're things that we can put into practice quite quickly. Whereas our innovation programs may take a year, two years, 10, 15 years to deliver any real business value. So by having this sort of mixed portfolio, we'll find a greater level of engagement, greater levels of sustainability, and greater levels of business value at different horizons on our path. So perhaps as innovators, we may begin to see our programs looking more like this, of a whole range of different parallel activities that are in many ways interconnected, because of course, none of these things sit in isolation. So you may be running down the innovation path and find you have a need to reduce the cost of the product you're about to go down. But if we look at the fundamentals of what types of source solutions deliver, it's about bringing disparate expertise together, collaborating, making some good decisions, and then putting things into practice. As I said, that's applicable to a whole range of different areas of business focus. So the final um, uh, foundation is about losing the data. Remember this guy, the behavioral guy, the guy that uh, perhaps we need to think about, and also our traditional perhaps idea funnels. There's the data that sits right across this different this, this ecosystem that we can use to help improve the performance of our program. So we can look at whether people are logging on, whether they're sharing their ideas, whether they're collaborating, whether they're voting, are they carrying out reviews, are they contributing to concepts and projects, are they actually doing all the things that we would hope them to do in the whole path of our innovation journey. But we can also look at the metrics, so the actual data that underpins um, all of those different elements of our workflow. So is our portfolio increasing or contracting? Do we have higher quality content in our portfolio or have we just got more of the same? So if we look at the behaviors first, we do need to look at this over time. In isolation, single idea campaigns or single open ongoing process innovation processes will not give you the data that will dictate whether your program is sustainable or not. Remember, going back earlier on, we were looking at increasing levels of engagement, increasing levels of collaboration. But every individual innovation project will have different metrics that you'd be looking towards. So sometimes you don't care about engagement at all. You just want really high quality. You want that one single idea that sits out there somewhere that you just don't know of. You don't care how many people you need to go through to get it. Others, you are going to care about engagement and you are going to care that lots of people are participating. So that skews the data a little bit. So we've got to look at these statistics over time. We also look at the intensity and the focus of the program. So how often are we actually getting people involved? If it's every six months, we might find that people become disengaged in that time window. They didn't really hear what happened next, and so it's big time gaps between activities which are going to stifle participation. But likewise, if we, can, we have it too compressed and we're asking for people to contribute all the time, there's just too much that's being requested of them and they disengage with it all. So getting that balance right is a bit of an art and it's something that we should judge over time. We also need to look at the topics that we're, uh, we're, we're looking at, we're considering. So are the topics that we're asking engaging to just a small group of people or a wide community of people? Because again, that will drive the type of levels of engagement that we see from different pockets of the organization.
But if we take all of that into consideration, look at participation and all the other metrics associated with that over time, in, in combination with the intensity of our program and the topics that we're looking at, we begin to get a picture of whether the, the culture of the organization is changing in the right direction. So what we do is we focus on that shape, we keep measuring, we keep seeing what, whether we are progressing or not. We be, will begin to see different data emerging over time. So, what I say is capture all the data elements of your program, not just the core metrics associated with the portfolio values, but monitor over time and see what we need to adjust in order to drive the right types of engagement that we want to see. So, for example, if you see a couple of divisions struggling with participation, maybe look for topics, maybe look for campaigns or engagement themes, innovation themes that will engage those particular communities. Try to find some community volunteers in those groups, find out what pe their people care about, what's on top of the day job. See if we can run some topics that are going to align with those, those sorts of interests, which are going to bring them into the program as a whole. The second part of looking at the data is, is considering what we can measure. If you think about perhaps Hype's standard workflow, there's a whole range of different steps here. That underpinning each of those, we have different types of questions. So we think about our hunting grounds, our strategic innovation areas. We can focus on one thing, or we can focus on many things. Um, we may have different uh, metrics and thresholds and KPIs that we're looking to perform towards within each of these themes. If we think about campaigns, do we need a few occasionally that go organizational wide? Are we looking at very many of different scales? Are we looking at lots of small campaigns focused on very detailed questions? When we generate ideas, do we actually need more ideas? Or do we have enough? We just need higher quality ideas, perhaps ideas that have greater value for the company. Is it what we're looking for, quality or, or, or quantity? Because the, the dynamics are different. Once we get into concepts, do we simply need more, more choice? Do we need them to be more highly more differentiated versus their uh, other concepts that we have? Or do we need to have the value of those concepts increase? Usually, as organizations, we are capacity restricted. We can only manage so much content. So maybe the question is, do we have the best possible concepts in our funnel to work on or not? And of course, then the same questions will go, go through for projects as well. If we think about our answers to these questions at every step, and if we have cons relatively consistent answers to those questions, when we measure the data, we'll begin to build up a picture of whether we are having a greater level of impact of innovation across the, across the company. Now, this is something that we'll build up as a picture over time, but it's not something that we do um, immediately, but having consistent questions and consistent answers to those questions at the different stage to recognize what the real need is in the business and how we should react to that is crucial. So, I think we've covered this already. Keep an eye on the portfolio, look at the behaviors as well. In the tactical world, try to measure business benefit as quick as you can, because the more we can, we can share our success stories, the more outcomes that we can share, the greater belief the organization is going to have in this type of technique, and the greater levels of engagement we're going to get. Of course, the greater engagement we're going to get, the more diverse opinion we're going to see, and then the whole thing flows again. So once we get the ball moving, it tends to become much more self-sustaining, providing we keep a keen eye on these four foundations. So just to summarize before we go to some questions and answers, firstly, adapt your messages and your tactics according to the maturity of your organization. Recognize your organizational shape as best you can. Even if it's a guess on day one, try to make a judgment on what the biggest challenges are that you face. Is it one of awareness? Is it one of changing people's minds on the power of this kind of program? And then keep a keen eye on whether engagement is building over time, whether collaboration is building over time, and adapt accordingly. If there are pockets or there are divisions that aren't participating, try to find topics that are going to interest them and see if we can drag them in that way. Look for those people that sit right at the top of that pyramid shape, right at the top, those people that are key enthusiasts, key advocates of the program. Those are the people that are really good targets for become community volunteers. They can help spread the word, they can help communicate to their network, share success stories, and ensure that they have a really strong local focus on new innovation areas that may come up. Use them as your informal network. They have day jobs. In the course of those day jobs, they can be incredibly helpful to your program. 
try to go beyond the normal core innovation sphere, try and view innovation in the broadest possible terms, anything that has value to it. That doesn't mean changing the, str the strategy dramatically, but it does mean complementing your standard innovation practices with things that have more of a tactical benefit in certain circumstances. This will bring different types of people into the world of collaborative innovation. It will help you deliver earlier stage value, which can then be communicated and again boost belief and confidence in the program. But crucially, the more diverse groups of people you can bring in, everything else will benefit over time and people will begin to see that they can actually play a role in this world of, of collaborative innovation. And finally, ask yourself some key questions. Measure how things change over time. Try to remain consistent with those key questions as long as you can with regard to managing that portfolio. What's the real challenges that we're looking to face here? And look at both the behaviors that you see as well as the key metrics and data associated with um, the portfolio size and quality. So that brings to end the, the formal presentation. This, this webinar will be recorded and it will be shared on the Hype community. Uh, we have time now for, uh, for some questions and um, I'm going to just uh, click into the relevant boxes and uh, just see what questions we have. So just give me one second while I uh, take a look. If there are any questions that come up as, uh, as I'm talking, feel free just to put them into the, uh, the box and I'll address as many of them as I possibly can. Okay, so um, Colin, we currently have an active innovation program that has received quite positively. We now want to roll it out across the rest of the organization, including other countries. How do you build upon the already received enthusiasm from the participating countries to create the same or even better enthusiasm in the new countries? Well, there's a, there's a multi-tiered approach required here. I think the first one is to advertise the success and progress of the program that's already established. So actually look at marketing this program that you've already had with these new communities. That means potentially putting feet on the ground, maybe it means writing up some case studies, maybe it means running some webinars, but invite people before you even start to hear about the successes that have happened in the, pro in the, in the geography that you've already addressed. What this does is it raises people's awareness of the program as it stands. Simply by copying a program that's been established and successful in one community doesn't necessarily guarantee it will be successful in another. You are going to need to adapt it. That doesn't necessarily mean you need to do all the time corporate innovation bringing two communities together. You may have parallel activities that address different types of things. So the first step is raise awareness of the success that you've already had. The second point is to look for people that can act as anchor points within those new, new geographies or new communities. People that have a passion for this, that can help steer you towards key local campaigns, sponsors, or uh, key innovation professionals. People that can actually dedicate some portion of their time to actually getting the program established. If you can find, for example, three potential campaign sponsors, that's probably good enough to get you off the ground. You then have three or four months of running some activities focused on local needs. You've raised awareness of, of people's, um, of the progress within another community, and then you can build from there. The one of the biggest challenges though with going from one geography to a next is keeping a governance model. So some of the things that you'll do naturally within the community that's most local to you, like giving feedback, making sure reviews and, and evaluations happen in good time, keeping a good track of innovations as they progress down the, the funnel, are going to be harder to keep a watch on once you go beyond the community that's most local to you. So what I also encourage is actually do some local training with the key innovation professionals that sit within those geographies to actually make sure that they're adhering to best practices and then having monthly update meetings on progress and success just to share best practices within this new community so that they still keep confidence and they share the challenges and opportunities that they each face. I think if you can if to, just to summarize, raise awareness, find a few, few key starting points, look for people that can act as anchor points, and make sure that they are trained as you've been trained with good practices to make sure that governance model is consistent. Okay, so moving on to the next question. Uh, where do you cross the line between tactical incremental innovation? What's the difference between the two? Um, I think different organizations define this differently. So it's not really for me to say um, what the difference is. But what I would say is that um, most organizations have some form of view of where they want to occupy. If you look at the IDO um, interpretation of this, I think that's not a bad starting point on what's uh, uh, tactical, what's incremental innovation, what's radical innovation. Um, 
but at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter what the definitions are so much as long as they mean something for you. And normally speaking, if it was me, I think about tactical stuff as, a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as an activity that will help um, boost the performance of the innovation program in the short term. An incremental improvement would be an existing uh, development of an existing uh, product or service. And a radical thing would be stepping outside of our comfort zone in some direction, be it into a new market or into a new solution area. However, there are other organizations that wouldn't def don't define it like that at all. They may consider radical to be something which has um, uh, you know, a particular revenue impact or a particular order of magnitude impact. As I said, it's not really so important how we define it. It's more about how uh, what it means something to you as an organization. Okay, um, there's another question here. Um, if you have a range of campaign topics, what's a benchmark for active participation? Are you giving ideas, making comments, versus people basically saying, taking a look and not contributing? So normally speaking, if you had a range of topics over a period of, say, a year, and perhaps we were running 12 campaigns over that year, what I'd normally look for is about a 30 to 40 percent log on rate. So that's of 100 people, 30 to 40, actually log on and take some kind of look at what, what's happening. You'll have some which will perform much higher than that and some that will perform lower, but as an average, across a range of topics, I'll be looking at that. And then as a portion of the audience actually participates, I would say somewhere around the 15 to 20 percent of individuals that um, were invited, so out of the 100, 15 to 20 percent of those actually participating, either a comment or an idea. And I don't make the distinction between the two. I feel that if someone asks, is offering a constructive comment to an existing idea that's actually making, giving me a better understanding of that idea or building it in value, that's just as important as the idea that's submitted. So I tend to to think about it in that way. So 30 to 40% 30 to of your overall invitee group, if you're finding they're logging on, that's a good starting point. If you find sort of uh, uh, 15 to 20 percent of people of the overall invitee group are actually participating in some way, that's a good starting point. Now, you may feel that's quite low, but remember it's an average. So depending on the topic of the campaign that you run, it will vary in the participation rates. Generally speaking, if you offer a topic for a very large audience, you will find the percentage participation will be lower. For much smaller audiences, by definition, the question you're asking is a bit more specific. You'll find higher participation percentages. Okay, moving on to the next question. Are reward programs crucial to the sustainability of an innovation program? In most cases, we find that rewards are not crucial. However, recognition is, and I play, put that as part of the communications program. If people are recognized as being active contributors, as being successful contributors to the business, that makes them feel good. They share that, uh, that feeling with others, and more people will participate. Um, it's not absolutely critical, but we find it is, it is helpful, of course. Rewards don't necessarily provide sustainable engagement. In fact, so in some cases, rewards can create that big peak of participation followed by the big drop-off. Um, Rewards tend to drive relatively tactical participation, so people are excited by the reward as opposed to the topic itself, and often it's the topic that we really care about. So in most cases, we find rewards aren't so necessary to generate um, participation, uh, in most cases, recognition is more important. Having said all of that, there are some communities, uh, particularly some of my colleagues in the Middle East will tell me that as part of um, some customers' um, pay structures, rewards is, very, is a very big part. And if you have a pay structure that has rewards as a very big part, then anything like this should be treated as in parallel with that. Because if it's ignored, then it looks like it's, it's less important work, less important activity. But for most Western corporations, continental Europe, North America, rewards, in my experience, haven't driven significant um, uh, improvements in participation over a long period of time. Um, if you want to know more about motivations and what's really going to drag people in, what I'd encourage people to do is take a look at um, uh, the uh, Dan Pink videos on uh, motivation on YouTube. They're a great source of, uh, of interest. So another question here we have, how do you improve the quality of ideas? We have lots of ideas but no success stories yet. Um, so quality has a number of different aspects to it. And one of the first ones I always encourage is to look to try and boost collaboration between participants and ask people to build and improve the quality of concepts that you already have. In some cases, that may be just increasing the focus that you have on uh, collaboration as a really good, strong behavior within your marketing material. In other instances, it might be 
looking and running a campaign on something that you have already and, and asking people how can we make it better, how can we improve the quality of this. Often individuals don't have fully rounded concepts on day one. If you look at um, how an idea has been created that's been put into practice and trace that back, what you find is there's been many series of interventions on that idea, people building on it, ripping it apart, merging it with something else. Essentially it's a collaboration process. So collaboration is a key part of getting your higher quality. The other thing you can do is ask more detailed questions. So big, broad, open questions tend to yield big, broad, but incomplete answers. Small, focused questions tend to yield higher quality responses, although you tend to drive less of them. So those few things will help boost quality. Um, okay, we have another question here. What in intervals do you recommend for doing idea campaigns? Um, that depends, really does. For immature programs, organizations just starting off on this path, what I'd normally say is look at about one or two a month maximum. Obviously, it will depend on the duration of the campaign, but normally our core recommendation is two to three weeks. So for early stage programs, maximum of, of two is probably a good, good amount at any one time. And but the intervals between them, I would try to keep relatively short. That will help keep momentum. Remember, once the campaign's finished, the work isn't over. So you'll have a review process, you'll have other activities. There's communications associated with the campaign just run. Now, having said all of that, there are plenty of organizations that run the campaigns continuously. Now, some of the most mature programs may run 50 to 60 campaigns a year. But they're not all with the same audiences. So that's the other key metric. Within the same audience group, I try to keep the amount of campaigns in an early stage program in parallel relatively low and the gaps between them relatively short. So one a month is a perfectly reasonable uh, period of time. So two to three week running time and the next month we'll set up another one. If you find that you're getting good levels of participation, it's growing over time, begin to add more in. Remember, you don't necessarily need to formally invite every invitee to a campaign. You can simply have it there in the background, invite the specific group that you care about, that you know have, have something of interest, and as people are flowing naturally through the tool, they'll see other campaigns that they're interested in. Okay, further question. We have some reasonable attendance rates during the campaigns, but only after quite a lot of pushing. Do you have any practical suggestions how we get more of a pull, a proactive participation as opposed to react? Well, it's, it's a tricky one. I mean, certainly, the more communications and marketing you do, the more you will drive participation. And you need to keep that, that, that path going until you find that people are naturally participating. And one idea would be to have what I just mentioned, which is to have other campaign topics running in the background. So it's something that people log in every day just to see what's, what's happening, see what's, what's around. The other thing that you can do um, if you use Hype is to use a feature called Community Graduation where we actually encourage people to go and share their ideas and their, um, their, their, their thoughts with other people and that will help fast forward those ideas to be evaluated. The idea is if you can't convince two or three of your buddies that your idea is good, then why should management take a look at it? So what that does is it forces the community to actually spread the, um, the communications around this program like a virus across the organization, dragging more people in. That's a quite a good way of doing it. Um, the other thing you can do, of course, is to look to um, uh, offer some form of recognition for key participants, so perhaps people that are uh, great idea submitters or collaborators. You measure that using points. Um, if you use Hype again, you'll, you'll be aware of that. Track who those key participants are and then offer some form of recognition, maybe a training course, some form of uh, reward perhaps. Um, it doesn't drive participation, but it keeps people logging in, keeps people active in the process. That's, that's a good way of, of bringing them in. Okay, uh, one final question. Find out a technical community are much more likely to contribute. How do we get more input from non-techies? Okay, so this is really around the phrasing of the question. If you ask a question that is written in technical language, it will trap people that like that, that find that understandable. If you ask a question that's more generic in nature, it may appeal less to the techies, but it will appeal to a different group of people. A key thing that I would always recommend is, when you have a question, go and ask the communities before you launch the campaign, whether they actually understand the question, whether they're interested in the question, is this topic stimulating to them, will they come and participate? If, they find, if the answers are no, and these are the people that you're targeting, then you know something's up with the question. 
So try and think about asking questions in different ways that are appropriate to the types of communities you wish to engage. Not everybody will be able to understand some technical jargon. That's not to say you shouldn't run campaigns like that, but just expect anything that's written that way is only going to attract a certain subset of people. The other thing you can do is run campaigns on topics that are completely separate to innovation, but are going to attract those sorts of people in a different way, so perhaps cost savings or looking at the voice of the community or sharing best practices, that will drag in a different group of people, people that wouldn't normally come and participate. And of course, once they're dragged into the process, you may find it easier to get them to address more standard innovation activities. So I'm going to draw a line under here as we're already five minutes past the hour. Uh, thank you ever so much for your active contributions and listening today. As I mentioned, these slides will be um, shared on Hype's innovation community and you'll receive a communication from Hype um, shortly after this telling you where to go to uh, download the recording of this. Um, feel free to contact me directly as well. You have my email address there, colin.nelson at hype.de. So if there are any questions that either you'd like more detail on or anything that you want to follow up on, feel free to drop me a note and I will uh, do my best to respond in good time. So thank you to Mitch for helping. Uh, we're going to draw this recording to a close now and uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks for your attention and I hope to be able to welcome you soon again.